Thank you very much, Cindy, and thank you all for coming. It's nice to get out of the bad weather into a, a dark room <laughs> to listen uh, to a superannuated teacher talk about Shakespeare. Um, it's a great pleasure uh, to be here. Of course, it's a great honor to be um, to be a small part of, of Tucson's uh, premier theatrical uh, enterprise, of uh, the Rogue Theater, uh, a veritable jewel in the crown of Tucson's cultural life, as, as we all know. <laughs> uh, so, Midsummer Night's Dream. I'd like to begin with a question. It's a question that uh, a friend of mine put to me uh, three or four weeks ago uh, when we were talking about uh, the pr upcoming production. And um, he said, well, I haven't, I, I, I don't remember seeing Midsummer's Ice Cream. Uh, and I, um, I read it in, in high school, um, but I don't remember very much about that. And he said, and all of you probably received this question as well. Uh, not about necessarily a Shakespeare play, but about a play or about a movie or about a novel, whatever. Um, what's it about? <laughs> now the loaded word there is about. And so the, I said, well, and I proceeded to say, it's about four young people, uh, two boys and two girls, if I may use those words, uh, two boys and two girls, and uh, Demetrius loves Helena, and Helena loves Demetrius, and Lysander loves uh, Hermia, and Hermia loves um, uh, Lysander, at least before the play begins. Uh, then the play begins, then the play begins, and something has altered. What had been a very nice arrangement and I'm going to use the expression, a romantic quadrangle. And of course, I'm borrowing the word quadrangle from plane geometry. I'm dating myself when we used to study plane geometry. Uh, on the analogy with a romantic triangle, it's not exactly a romantic triangle, but it is a romantic a quadrangle. And before the play begins, it's very nice. It's very harmonious. It's very symmetrical. Um, it's very stable. It's very stable. A nature abhors a vacuum, but nature, in my experience, really abhors stability. <laughs> and uh, as the play begins, uh, Demetrius uh, has fallen out of love. It's a wonderful expression, isn't it? To fall into love or to fall out of love. Fall. No one falls. Uh, no one falls intentionally. We fall accidentally, we fall arbitrarily. It's completely beyond my control. It is completely beyond. That's a wonderful pronoun, isn't it? It is completely beyond my control. So, this is how it begins. Already my friend is yawning at this point. Uh, and I said, well, there's more. And so I, I adumbrated briefly um, that there is a, a falling out of love, and then there's a falling out of love again, and then there's a falling in love again, and then there's a falling out of love again, and then they fall in love again right, and then we have stability uh, reestablished and harmony reestablished, and uh, the play comes to an end. And he said, well, this sounds rather complicated. I said, well, actually, Jason, there's more. <laughs> I said, more? I said, yes, there's more. There's a great deal more. And so uh, what I uh, decided that I should do is to actually try to sort it all out, to sort it all out. So I sorted it all out, and in item one, uh, item one of the, um, of the uh, handout that I've uh, cobbled together, I said that there are strands of action. I'm going to talk about this for a little bit now. There are strands of action, strands of action, strands for the plot. Now, I like the word strands because it doesn't imply that there are five or four or three, however you want to count them, I'm counting them these days as five, uh, bits of action that go into the plot, that go into the plot. And uh, the first one is uh, the one that I came up with, and probably if you were asked that, or most of you if you were asked that, what the play is about, you would say that, it, and then you'd start talking about what happens to uh, the four young uh, lovers. Uh, <clears throat> I didn't count the lines, 
Uh, but that uh, certainly is prominent, uh, that part of the action, uh, the part of the action that deals with uh, Lysander, Hermia, and, 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 the other, and the other two. And uh, part of the reason is, of course, just the length of that part, how much material is devoted to, the, to, those, to those characters. But it's also related to, it's also related to what happens to them. So this is one part of the action, but then there is, of course, some more parts to the action, more strands to the, to the, to the action. And uh, certainly there's the, what it begins with, Theseus and Hippolyta. Uh, these, are, uh, these are humans, like the young lovers. Uh, these are humans, and Theseus and Hippolyta are talking about their wedding day, and they're not, uh, they're not young lovers. Uh, and Shakespeare takes these from, uh, from ancient myth and ancient tradition. And Shakespeare, as you know, uh, does not borrow. Shakespeare steals. <laughs> he takes it and he doesn't give it back. He takes it, that is to say, and makes it his own. And so, he, and he does it, he seems, he seems from our point of view, to work with remarkable freedom, remarkable license and sureness and certainty. Uh, and so he does here. And so he has Theseus and, and Hippolyta, really from a very different kind of tradition than uh, Lysander and Hermia and Demetrius and Helena that are just made up, although I think Helena's name is significant. We'll get to that perhaps in a moment. So then we have the third strand of action that are, I use a phrase that, um, uh, that is used in the play, the rude mechanicals. These are six characters who are tradesmen, they're craftsmen. Uh, the principal one is Peter Quince, and he seems to be a master carpenter. I think that's lovely, because a, a carpenter is someone who builds something. And he uh, doesn't write the play, Pyramus and Thisbe, never mind, Pyramus and Thisbe is also uh, comes from Roman uh, tradition and, and mythology. Um, but they, 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 he puts it, puts it together, puts it together. Uh, and at one point he says, this is a play well made. This is a play well made. Uh, Shakespeare would have liked that, would have liked that, liked that notion that his plays are well made because all of his plays are well made. And this one is, this is remarkably, miraculously, distinctly well made. And so we have, uh, we have this part of the action and this, these, these characters are all men, they're all tradesmen. Um, it's not that they have trouble with the language, but they have, oh, I don't know, they have a certain innocence about the language. Uh, and they speak in a very different, a very different, a very different register from what the other characters uh, speak. Indeed, that's part of the, that's part of the genius of the play, uh, the remarkable range of language. And, and we'll comment on that as, as, as we, we go on. And these characters, wonderfully enough, are preparing a play. And it's a play that it's gonna turn out to be, it's a play within a play. This sounds like Pirandello, doesn't it? Uh, all of a sudden, we not only have a play that is written, but we watch the play being produced. We'll watch casting, that comes first. Well, not quite first, the text comes first. And then we have casting, then we have rehearsal, and then we have a production. And that's just what we have in the play. That is to say, we have a play within the play, and we have a play within the play that is not only play, that is say, acted, but we watch the audience in the play, and we hear the audience in the play comment on the play. And uh, so the complexity is extraordinary. And it's not only complexity, uh, but it's complication complication. And then finally, uh, the way I've, uh, or almost finally, we have, the, we have the fairies. We have the fairies. So we're completely, we're now from Roman mythology to uh, much of it is native folklore, English, traditional uh, lore, and so on. And we have one character who really isn't a fairy, but sort of seems to be a fairy, and that is Puck. And Puck, I don't want to ruin the story for you. But Puck is spectacular. P Puck is normative. Puck is a repository of wisdom. And if I regret anything about today and Saturday uh, afternoon, it's that I, I'm not going to be able to talk much about Puck. But uh, I want to assure you 
that there is no character that comes close to Puck in the play, or perhaps in the, on the entire canon of, of Shakespeare, for his wisdom, uh, perhaps even perhaps even his holiness. But uh, lest I make him sound like the Pope, I, I'll, I'll move, move on. So these are, these these is what we have, and then we have, of course, we really have another strand of action. And that is the strain of action that is in the play within the play. That is in the play uh, a lamentable comedy or a comical tragedy. Uh, these craftsmen are wonderful with the licenses they take with the language. Um, and uh, that's what we see. So we don't have one, we don't have two, no more, we don't have three, we don't have four. We have five strands of action that make up the plot. Now, uh, my friend at this point is saying, I really don't think that uh, I'm going to come to the production. Uh, and I said, no, 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 Jason, you must come to the production. It's a rogue theater. Uh, oh, 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 and it's also Shakespeare. Uh, so, uh, it's integrated, he says. All of this is integrated. I said, yes, quite. It's, it's remarkable. It's remarkable. And as you see, I put down here in this, this bloodless list of of, of the strands of the action, uh, what scenes they appear in. And the reason I do this is to show, is to show almost visually how Shakespeare intermeddles these, the strands of action. Intermeddles the strands of action. They are inter integrated as integers, one, it's a number. And he takes all of these parts with all these different characters who speak in different registers, and he melds it into one. He melds it into, it's not chaos. And the reason it's important is not just the aesthetic aspects of it, of the play, but, be, but what is important about it and what is relevant about it and what is uh, so meaningful about it is that it means, dramatically speaking, it means significantly. It has to do with the substance. It has to do with the substance. Indeed, they're inextricably bound up with one another. And so uh, we say, well, integrated, come on. <laughs> integrated, how can you integrate all of this stuff from different uh, heritage, different traditions, and so on? Well, let's get right down to what the play is about. Remember I said the word about is what is operative here. Uh, when we're asked this question, when we think about fiction, when we think about the theater, even when we think about lyric poetry, what we think about is the literal sense. Is the literal sense. And so this is what we describe. We describe the characters, we describe the action. But what is it about and how is it unified? Well. It's unified because all of these strands of action, all of these strands of action deal with love. Deal with love. And we may say romantic love, but even that raises all kinds of questions, doesn't it? Uh, it's love that is shared by different characters, different ranks of characters. I mean, goodness, we have, we have love between fairies. Who would have thought? <laughs> Who would have thought? Well, what's so different about fairies? Well, one thing's different is, and I'm gonna refer to, um, I'm gonna refer to Oberon and Titania as middle-aged. Now, that's not quite right because they're, they're immortal, and so I don't know what, uh, if you're immortal, I don't know what middle-aged looks like. <laughs> Uh, particularly at one side of uh, 60 or 70 or 80, I'm not sure what it looks like. So, we have love. But in addition, but in addition, we have this connection between them, between the strands of, of the action. And the way that they are put together is ever so significant. That is to say, it's ever so meaningful. So what happens, we're talking about plot, we're talking about action, what happens? Now we're moving from what a play is about to what happens in the play. What happens in the play is that we have movement. It is not static, it moves. There seems to be some observation of time, but it's not strict. Anyway, it's just a few days. 
and the kind of the days run into night, and the night is very long. But what about the overall movie, movement? Well, you notice that I put the last scene of the play, Act 5, Scene 1, I put that, I put that in italics. Now, I put that in italics because that's distinctive. That's the one scene in the play, it's the one scene in the play where all strands of the action have coalesced. They all appear in that scene. And so we move from, well, where do we move from? We move from this rather extraordinary opening of the play where we have Theseus talking about how wonderful the situation is, except he'd really like to get this wedding over so he can get into bed with his wife-to-be. That's what he wants to get through. And so that's discussed, and she says, don't worry, it's going to go pretty quickly, four days. And then we have a lot occurring. And before we get, what, before seven or eight lines, we have a legal problem. And the complication begins. And the complication begins. And it gets pretty, as we used to say in the 60s, it gets pretty heavy. Because Aegeus, a father, says, I want my daughter either put to death or to marry the man I want. Well, all of a sudden, this isn't very funny. And that's what we think a comedy is. It is, com it is funny. A comedy is funny. It is humorous. It does make us laugh. But there's much more. <laughs> what makes a comedy is a comedy is the way that the action unfolds and the way that it moves. And it moves from that which is irresolved, that which is replete with tension, to that which is harmonized, that which is orderly. That's the way that it moves. And that movement, that movement traces a journey. It may be four days, it may be longer, but it traces a journey. Now the word comedy comes from a Greek word komos, which means revelry, or to revel. That is to say, to celebrate. And what do we celebrate? We celebrate, we celebrate occasions for happiness. For what has happened and for what we can anticipate happening. So that we have comedies. And of the 14 comedies that Shakespeare writes, just about all of them in this way, more or less, usually more, they end in betrothal, in engagement, they end in matrimony. And what is engagement, what is betrothal, what is matrimony without a party? So it ends in song, most often. It ends in dancing, most often. And there are productions which in the text, Shakespeare's text, we don't have song and dance. And frequently in productions, and I love this myself, they put Producers put and directors put song and dance in. And it's wonderful because what we move to is integration in the larger sense of the word. We put it, what we move towards is harmony between, between people, between couples preeminently, and fathers and daughters, fathers and sons, mothers and daughters, mothers and sons. And even further, as we shall see in Midsummer Science Dream. So that is what is distinctive about comedy, is it moves towards resolution. Now, probably many of you are thinking, and I know some of you have heard this before, the great, the great text that we have from the entire modern period, I, I date modernity from uh, the 13th century, uh, is, of course, is of course from Italy. All good comes from Italy. Uh, and that is the Divine Comedy. Now that's a title that is, Dante does not give to the, to the poem, but uh, uh, an Italian scholar and poet in the um, 14th, early 15th century gives to it. And it's quite opposite, the Divine Com Comedy. Why is it a comedy? There's not, no one sits down, I'm going to sit down and read some Dante so I can laugh. And no one does that. It's a comedy because of the way that the plot moves. Where does it begin? 
it begins in a very grave place. It begins in what is serious. Halfway through the journey of my life, I found myself in a sewa oscura. I found myself in a dark wood. So begins the Divine Comedy. And that is an introduction to the first canticle, that is to say the inferno, that is hell. Halfway through my life, I find myself in hell. Not an odd position to be in, many of us would say. And then he moves forward. He moves forward. And he moves forward from hell to purgatory. Things are looking up, well at least slightly, to the purgatorio. The journey is not over. The journey is not over. And finally, he moves with the aid of uh, Virgil, uh, who can't be with him, but will give him the direction, uh, to heaven, to the paradiso. And he moves from isolation. He moves through experience. He moves through struggle. Very realistic, to say the least. And then he moves to transcendence. And he moves to union with the woman that he loved, who died in life, and is blessed. Indeed, her name is Beatrice, the blessed one. And he is reunited with her. And from the darkness of the wood, not only is he united with Beatrice, but he is united with God himself or herself. And that is identified with light, of course. And so that's the great journey here, and that is the pattern that underlines, con uh, underlies uh, comedy. Now, coming back to uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, uh, what do we have? What do we have in Midsummer Night's Dream? Well, we have the situation laid forth in three scenes. The first scene is Act One, Scene One, Act One, Scene Two, and Act Two, Scene. Scene one. And we're going to see a bit of Act Two, Scene one, uh, I'll put on for us just in a moment. Um, I would like to look at a, a passage, and the passage is from Act Two, Scene one, and this is Item Two on the uh, handout um, from the Silver Science Stream, uh, and it's a discussion. The the fragment that I take I have quoted here is, is, is from 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 Act Two, Scene one, and this is a discussion between Oberon and uh, and Puck. And this is wonderfully introductory because we see at least a big part of the characterization, big part of the matter here. And what this deals with is a convention. And the convention is central to the, to the play and it sounds rather unrealistic. And the convention is a love potion. A love potion. Oberon tried to make it up with his queen, but they didn't resolve the the problem that they had earlier in this scene. So Oberon wants to take revenge. And he takes revenge by getting this magic potion, uh, which is a love potion, and he's going to put it on her eyes. And this love potion uh, is such that when the, when the person whose eyes uh, have been anointed with this, uh, with this substance, as soon as that person wakes up, the first thing that that person sees, regardless, even if it's an ass, falls in love with. Falls in love with. This is sounding pretty realistic, isn't it? I mean, we've all read about, we've all read about people who have fallen in love with asses. Or fallen in love with somebody who turns out to be an ass. But I didn't see that, that you see. Uh, so, this is what happens. Now, how do we get there? How do we get there? Well, Shakespeare uses this potion. Well, my God, a potion? Well, now, a potion has been used for a long time, at least in fiction. And uh, one of the, well, there's some evidence for it in ancient Greece, but also uh, it really begins in the, uh, about the 12th century or so with Celtic legend about the magic potion, the, the story that you all know of Tristan and Isolde, which then the Germans fastened onto and made it, th made it their own, coming up into the, big, in the 19th century in Wagner and the, taking some time off from writing the Ring Cycle, writes two operas. Uh, Tristan and Zoldi, Meistersinger, and uses it for Tristan and Zoldi. And it goes on. 
it goes on. We have it, of course, in Shakespeare and Midsummer Night's Dream. And I learned just the other day that it actually appears in Harry Potter as well. And then I didn't believe it when this person told me this. It appeared, in, uh, I pretended that I believed uh, in Harry Potter. But then I also learned that there is a contemporary novelist, Lisa Moore, I don't know if any of you know this, and writes teenage fiction. I'm not making this up, really. Uh, and the, the title of the novel is Flannery. And there's two teenagers who are in a free enterprise class together, and they, well, anyway, it involves a love potion as well. All of which is to say this is, these things that seem to be absurd ideas to us have an extraordinary, not half-life life. Now, Shakespeare takes this, and I'll explain this here in just a moment. Shakespeare takes this because he uses it. It is practical. Shakespeare's a practical man of the theater. All he was, we can be sure about, that he was really committed to was a box office. He didn't make money out of his publishing play, didn't make money out of his publishing poetry. He made money off the box office, and so did his fellow actors, uh, and so on. So what he had to do is to keep the audience with him. That was very important. Now, he didn't waste time. So, what does he have to do with? He has to do with language. Now, if you look at this first exchange, just for a moment, it's a conversation between Oberon and Puck. And Oberon is telling Puck, go get this drug for me. But instead of saying, go get this drug for me, this is what he says. Thou rememberest, since once I sat upon a promontory and heard a mermaid on a dolphin's back, uttering such dulcet and harmonious breath that the rude sea grew civil at her song, and certain stars shot madly from their spheres to hear the sea maid's music. I remember that very time I saw, but thou couldst not, flying between the cold moon and the earth, Cupid all armed. A certain aim he took at a fair vestal thrown by the west, and loosed his love shaft smartly from his bow, as it should pierce a hundred thousand hearts. But I might see young Cupid's fiery shaft quenched in the chaste beams of the watery moon, and the imperial vultures passed on in maiden meditation fancy free. Yet mark, I wear the bolt, that's a, the arrow, fell. It fell upon a little western flower before milk white, now purple with love's wound, and maidens call it love and idleness. Fetch me that flower, the herb I showed thee once, the juice of it sleeping on sleeping eyelids laid, will make or man or woman madly dote upon the next live creature that it sees. Fetch me this herb, and be thou here again, ere the Leviathan can swim the league. So, what we have here in the first place, of course, is verse. The verse is blank for that is to say it depends on for its rhythm, for its distinctive characteristic, and for its uh, poetry doesn't depend on rhyme. That's why we call it blank. Usually ten syllables, sometimes nine, sometimes sometimes eleven. It's replete with all kinds of metaphor, all kinds of mythical allusions, and so on. Some of it is so evocative, isn't it? He recalls where he was sitting on a promontory looking over the sea. And he could hear a mermaid, and a mermaid on a dolphin's back. Dolphins are wonderful, of course, mammals. Uh, and uh, we have good evidence that they actually sing to each other. I had an office mate who believed that they wrote poetry. I said, this is rather extraordinary. Do you really? He said, oh, and not only do they, they have, they make poetry, but they have little universities and they have dolphins who are English teachers who teach the poetry. I said, yeah, yeah. you've been smoking too much, uh, whatever it is, uh, and uh, so on. Uh, but there is this kind of tradition about the, f uh, kind of a bond between dolphins and human beings, writing on a, a mermaid, a sea. Mers, what mares, a mermaid and a dolphin's back, uttering such dulcet and harmonious breath, not song, breath, dulcet and harmonious breath that the rude sea grew civil at her song. And this remarkable, poetic, beautiful, figurative, metaphoric statement is all 
a little narrative, a little gem of a story, and it's mythological. Now, why do I say it's mythical? Mythological. It's myth. A myth. A myth is a narrative, and a myth. It's a narrative that is used to explain a mystery. Now, whatever love is, and I'm not going to explain what love is. Uh, whatever love is, it's a mystery. That doesn't mean that it's unknowable. It means it's can never thoroughly be known. It's always surprising. It can be very, very good, and then those of us who read novels uh, can be very, very bad. And so it's a mystery. It's a mystery. And that's what he is explaining here. And how does this, what is the metaphor here? The metaphor is, is a conventional one, again going back to antiquity of the idea of Cupid, this little person does a much many clothes on and blindfolded and he's armed with a bow and arrow and so this is shot God knows where the arrow is going to go it's complete once again we're in this realm of accidental arbitrary unknowable unknowable and so he uses this and what is interesting here is that is, 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 is the instrument that Shakespeare is evidently attracted to is a weapon, a bow and arrow. It, you are struck by it. Woody Allen used to say, maybe he still does, the heart has its own laws. The heart has its own laws. And there's nothing you can do about it. That's the implication. After all, it's being shot by a little boy you know how reasonable children are, and who's blind, or at least blindfolded, and so it strikes, it strikes, and it's a weapon. And if you look at all of the love that's in Midsummer's Night's Dream, weapons and violence is involved or is threatened. Theseus, of course, is a great warrior. Hippolyta was a great warrior. They fought against each other. The queen of the Amazons. Great archer in mythology. And Theseus says in the first lines of the play, I wooed thee with my sword. And then the four young lovers, well, look at what happens to them. The guys, of course, the guys, of course, do the usual thing when they start loving each other's girlfriends. Uh, let's take this outside. Uh, you would expect that. You'd expect that. But even, even Hermia and, and uh, Helena, who were friends from girlhood, girlhood, very close, it gets pretty heavy with them. And at one point, we see all this, this repressed, all this re repressed frustration coming to the surface in this moment of great tension uh, between the girls. And, uh, Hermia says something about uh, Helena says something about Hermia being short. Oh, I see the way that it goes. She says, just because you're tall, and of course we know that Helen, anyone named Helen, has to be tall. It's like Helen of Troy. We know that Helen of Troy was not short. She was the most beautiful woman in the ancient world. So she's Helen, Hel Hellenic. I mean, Greek beauty is never short. <laughs> Never short. And so Helena says, uh, uh, watch out, she's, she's always been cursed, even when we were girls, and more. I'm short, you say. Well, I'm short, and this is in Act 3, Scene 2. She says, I'm short, but my, 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 my hands are long enough to reach to your eyes to claw your eyes out. <laughs> and then, of course, Pyramus and Thys Thysbe, they, 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 they die. So uh, this, is, uh, this, is, this is part of the substance of the play and is part of the great thematic, the thematic drift of the play. So that while comedy makes us laugh, while comedy moves towards the light in one way or another, it is also replete with shadows. So Shakespeare takes this device and he embellishes it and it turns out to be the generation of the entire play's action within 
less than 450 lines. So, if we could uh, have the uh, bit of the scene that we're going to see, this is Act Two, Scene One, with Oberon Puck, uh, and uh, we will see. My gentle Puck, come hither. Thou remembrest, since once I sat upon a promontory and heard a mermaid on a dolphin's back uttering such dulcet and harmonious breath that the rude sea grew civil at her song and certain stars shot madly from their spheres to hear the sea maid's music. I remember that very time I saw, but thou couldst not, flying between the cold moon and the earth Cupid, all armed, a certain aim he took at a fair vestal throned by the west, and loosed his love shaft smartly from his bow as it should pierce a hundred thousand hearts. <laughs> but I might see young Cupid's fiery shaft quenched in the chaste beams of the watery moon, and the imperial vultress passed on in maiden meditation, fancy free. Yet marked I where the bolt of Cupid fell. It fell upon a little western flower before milk white, now purple with love's wound. Fetch me that flower, the herb I showed thee once. The juice of it on sleeping eyelids laid will make or man or woman madly dote upon the next live creature that it sees. <laughs> Fetch me this herb and be thou here again ere the leviathan can swim a league. I'll put a girdle round about the earth in 40 minutes. Having once this juice, I'll watch Titania when she is asleep and drop the liquor of it in her eyes. The next thing then she waking looks upon, be it on lion, bear, or wolf, or bull, on meddling monkey, or on busy ape, she shall pursue it with the soul of love. And there I take this charm from off her sight, as I can take it with another herb, I'll make her render up her boy to me. But who comes here? I am invisible, and I will overhear the comfort. I love thee not, therefore pursue me not. Where is Lysander and fair Hermia? The one I'll slay, the other slayeth me. Thou toldst me they were stolen unto this wood, and here am I, and mad within this wood, because I cannot meet my Hermia. Hence, get thee gone, and follow me no more. You draw me, you hard-hearted adamant, but yet you draw not iron, for my heart is as true as steel. Leave you your power to draw, and I shall have no power to follow you. Do I entice you? Do I speak you fair? Or rather, do I not in plainest truth tell you I do not, nor I cannot love you? And even for that do I love you the more. I am your spaniel, and Demetrius, neglect me. Lose me, only give me leave, unworthy as I am, to follow you. Tempt not too much the hatred of my spirit, for I am sick when I do look on thee. And I am sick when I look not on you. You do impeach your modesty too much, to leave the city and commit yourself into the hands of one who loves you not, to trust the opportunity of night and the ill counsel of a desert place with the rich worth of your virginity. Your virtue is my privilege, for it is not night when I do see your face. For you, in my respect, are all the world. Then how can it be said that I am alone when all the world is here to look on me? Look run from me, right me in the rift, and leave thee to the mercy of wild beasts. All the wild is have not such a heart as you. I will not stay thy questions. Let me go. Or, if thou follow me, do not believe, but I shall do thee mischief in the wood. Ah! ah, ah. <laughs> I, in the temple, the town, the field, you do me mischief. Fie, Demetrius! Your wrongs do set a scandal on my sex! <laughs> we cannot fight for love as men may do. We should be wooed. We're not made to woo. I'll follow thee and make a heaven of hell. 
to die upon the hand I love so well. Fare thee well, nymph. Ere he do leave this grove, thou shalt fly him, and he shall seek thy love. Hast thou the flower there, welcome wanderer? Ah, there it is. I pray thee give it me. I know a bank where the wild thyme blows, where ox lips and the nodding violet grows, quite over canopied with luscious woodbine, with sweet musk roses and with eglantine. There sleeps Titania some time of the night, lulled in these flowers with dances and delight, and with the juice of this I'll streak her eyes and make her full of hateful fantasies. <laughs> Take thou some of it, and seek through this grove. A sweet Athenian lady is in love with a disdainful youth. Anoint his eyes, but do it when the next thing he espies may be the lady. Thou shalt know the man by the Athenian garments he hath on. Affect it with some care, that he may prove more fond on her than she upon her love. And look thou meet me ere the first cock crow. Fear not, my lord, your servant shall do so. One of the things that uh, uh, you can see here that's very important is how I spoke a moment ago about the, the practicality of Shakespeare and about the business of bringing the audience along. So we, <clears throat> we had Oberon go through the introduction, as it were, to this magic potion, the uh, love potion, uh, so poetic, so uh, figuratively expressed and enchantingly uh, presented. And then he says to us, he says to us just how he's going to use this. And Shakespeare will do this again and again and again. And he does this again and again and again to anticipate the action in order to bring us along, in order to tie together, in order to integrate, in, to integrate the uh, integrate the, the, the plot. However, however manifold and however complex and however complicated uh, it is. The other thing that was very, very, very interesting to, to, to note, I was particularly interested, is how uh, we're going to have these interchanges here. We saw this, this is the first one that we have, the interchange between um, uh, Helen and Demetrius, and uh, how fraught the situation becomes. Now, we can't explore this, but it's a very elusive and interesting question. Why, why do we laugh at violence or at pain. How can this be? Are we all just sadistic? Um, or what is it? It's, it's elusive. Uh, early in the 20th century, there was a French philosopher, Henri Bersant, who wrote a, a wonderful little essay on why we laugh, why we, why we laugh. Well, what Shakespeare is going to do, and it'd be very interesting to watch the rest of the production here, is to bring out, I said earlier, bring out the shadows. Bring out the shadows because we see real suffering. We see real tension and we see a variety and a range of suffering and a variety and range of even subjective madness that verges on hallucination. And all of this, I can assure you, and uh, you probably know, somehow comes to a conclusion, and somehow comes to a conclusion which is uh, beneficent in a properly comic way. And so I would like to turn to the conclusion of the, of the play, because the play, uh, play's conclusions are always, particularly comedy, are always of, of great interest. So I should say particular interest, uh, particular kinds of, of interest. Uh, we have at the end of the comedy we have celebration and the conclusion here is particularly rich uh, this is uh, item five on the handout the play ends and ends and ends and ends uh, and this is the final ending uh, all of the all of the resolution has been struck uh, preeminently we have three uh, resolutions uh, the resolution of the matrimonial uh, engagement of, uh, of Theseus and Hippolyta, and then the two 
uh, couples uh, all who all have sorted sorted out. And we really even have the end of the play within uh, the play. And so they all, even though Puck and his fellows, or at least Puck, wishes to continue the production of Pyramus and Thisbe, uh, Theseus says, we've had quite enough. We've had quite enough. Uh, this is fine. And so they all go to bed. They all go retire for the night. It begins in the daylight. It begins at Theseus in Athens. And it moves to the daylight and to Theseus and to Theseus Athens and his, uh, and his uh, headquarters. And now the night has fallen. And the night has fallen and they're going to perfect, they're going to consummate their relationship and we're going to have the final conclusion of the play. And this is complex, this is complex. And really what we have, I like to say in the case of Miserable's Extreme, that it's a coda. It's a coda and there are two parts. One part is a benediction. Benediction is vaguely sacramental. Uh, it means uh, well-wishing, well-wishing. The couples are blessed, as we shall see and we shall hear. And the second part we have is much shorter, and it's called, from the Latin uh, word, it's called the plodete. And that is a convention that goes all the way back to Roman comedy, where one of the characters, or actually one of the actors, comes out on stage, walks through the fourth wall, that is to say, will directly address the audience. And this actor, who has played a part, but this actor addresses the, the, the audience as an actor and as a representative, as a representative, sort of like the concertmaster of a symphony orchestra. I'll come to this in more detail in just a moment. And what he does, and the reason we use the word plaudete, it's an imperative of the word plauda, which means applause, applause. Now Shakespeare does this again and again and again, not in all the comedies, but uh, very often. And he certainly does it here, and it's quite marvelous. That's the second part, but I want to get to the first part. And it's Puck who comes. And this is uh, 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 item three on the, uh, the handout, uh, Enter Puck. And he tells us a time, this is kind of introductory. This is the middle of the night. Now listen, this is not blank verse, this is rhyme verse, and it's particularly rhymed in four line units. We call it a quatrain. And you can hear this. And it's rhymed in lines that are seven, seven syllables and eight syllables. So it has a particular and almost audible rhythm. Here's Puck. Now the hungry lion roars and the wolf behowls the moon, whilst the heavy, heavy plowman snores, all with weary tasks foredone. Now the white-wisted bands do glow, while the screech owl screeching loud puts the wretch that lies in woe in remembrance of a shroud. Now it is the time of night that the graves all gaping wide, every one lets forth his sprite in the churchway paths to glide. And we fairies that do run by the triple Hecate's team from the presence of the sun, follow darkness like a dream, now are frolic. Not a wop mouse shall disturb this hallowed house. I am sent with broom before to sweep the dust behind the door. And so this is an introduction. This is the time and you notice how it begins the first uh, line one, five, and twelve. It begins with the word now, 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 now. And what is signaled here is of course the time of day, but it's a time of day that involves so much of what is part of the world that most of the humans, of course, in the play never see. Never see. Now it is this time. Now this time is when the fairies are out in the world. And what is looked upon and what is glanced at and what is evoked is the dark side. The hungry lion roars. The wasted brands that the logs are burning out. The screech owl screeching loud. Puts the wretch, the depressive, who suffers from insomnia lies in woe in remembrance of a shroud, and so on. And Puck is here with what? With a broom. And what is he going to do with a broom? He's going to sweep the dust behind the door. The dust, the dust. 
The dust is, of course, a biblical image. From ashes to ashes, to dust to dust. We have it in Genesis. It's incorporated in the 16th century in the Book of Common Prayer and the funeral service. Dust we are, and to dust we shall return. No more vivid symbol of mortality. What can Puck, Puck do? What can the fairies do? They can't do away with what mortals suffer, but they can offer a ward against it. So Puck is going to sweep the dust behind the door so that our attention lies elsewhere, so we can think about other matters, daylight matters. And then we have the invocation, the benediction. And this begins first with an exchange between Oberon and Titania. And we have called upon are the powers of the fairies to do what they can do with those who are just consummating their marriage and are beginning a new life together with one another, but also with the idea of, well, biologically new life if it is blessed with children. Dante, again, writes a great sonnet sequence. And he gives the name of the sonnet sequence, La Vita Nuova, the new life. That love will lead to marriage, will lead to a family, will lead to a new life between the two principles, and to new life in a literal sense. All of that is about, well, futurity is about survival, is about happiness. And so this is what we have, Oberon. Through the house give glimmering light by the dread and drowsy fire. Every elf and every sprite hop as light as bird from briar. And this ditty after me sing it, dance it trippingly, Titania. First rehearse your song by rote to each word at warbling note. Hand in hand, remember that image, with fairy grace will we sing and bless this place. And so now we have the blessing. Now until the break of day, through this house each fairy stay. To the best bright bed will we, which by us shall blessed be. And the issue there create ever shall be fortunate. So shall all the couples three ever true in loving be. And the blots of nature's hand shall not in their issue stand, never mole, hair lip, nor scar, nor mark prodigious such as our despised in nativity shall upon their children be. With this field do consecrate, every fairy take his gate, and each several chamber bless through this palace with sweet peace, and the owner of it blessed ever shall in safety rest. Trip away, make no stay, make me all by break of day. And so we can see a litany or a, a, a rehearsal of items that they will enjoy or that they may enjoy together. Not the least of which, of course, is that the couples shall be ever loving and ever true. Truth, as well as the survival of the children. And so they go off stage and we have the second part. The first part is a benediction. The first part is implicitly a prayer. So now we have the, an actor come forth, Puck comes forth, and he speaks to the audience directly. And it's again, it's a kind of prayer. And the prayer also involves a kind of promise, as prayers implicitly always do. They're kind of a deal that is struck. So, and listen to Puck, he sounds different. If we shadows have offended, think but this, and all is mended, so we have it in closed couplets, rhymed, decasyllabic lines. If we shadows have offended, think but this, and all is mended, that you have but slumbered here, while these visions did appear, and this weak and idle theme no more yielding but a dream. Gentles, do not reprehend, if you pardon, we will mend. And as I am an honest puck, if we have unearned luck, now to escape the serpent's tongue, we will make amends ere long, else the puck a liar call. So good night unto you all. Give me your hands if we be friends, and Robin shall restore amends. So what he means by this, what he means by this is, well, this, there may be some flaws to this play, but well, cut us some slack. And anyway, 
will make amends. Well, maybe there will be another performance. Maybe there will be another play. Meanwhile, good night. Now, we only have an afternoon in Tucson to go home to. But here, the audience will have to go through the night to home. Good night. May you be preserved during the night. And so meanwhile, give me your hands. Give me your hands. Certainly a universal gesture of understanding. We would like to say of humanity. Comedy moves towards relationship. Comedy moves towards resolution. And comedy, if it doesn't move towards a happy ending where all live happily ever after, remember all of those shadows, it ends in hope. It ends in hope. So give me your hands, he asks. And where do we have merging really coming to the fore, really being perfected? As always, it appears in the theater. So we in the audience give our hands. That is to say, we clap. Metaphorically, we stand our hands from our chairs. We may even be standing up. We extend our hands to the actors, to the producers, to the stage managers, to the author himself, whom, of course, Puck represents. And so what we do is then leave the world of Midsummer Night's Dream leave the world of two hours that is completely out of our realm of understanding, but which provides so much. What do I mean it provides so much? It provides diversion, it re provides pro uh, refreshment, it provides perspective, and it pro provides insight. And so we leave the theater with something, and that is the hope that we can come back to the theater and the belief, in our case, that we always will come back to the rogue. Thank you very much.